Chancellor presiding, you may be seated. Case 67, the State versus David Bannister. You are Mr David Bannister? That's correct, Your Honour. And what does the defendant plead? Not guilty, Your Honour. Because this case represents the first of its kind in this country, I expect both the prosecution and the defence to take particular care in the presentation of their evidence and arguments to this court. I expect that all parties concerned understand the special nature of this case. Essentially, we are dealing with a law that has been on the statute books for decades, and in some countries, even centuries. Up until now, these laws have never been repealed and therefore can still be enforced under existing state legislation. So, Council, we find ourselves with a very unique challenge. Yeah, a strange thing happened to me a while back. I was working on my farm on Sunday, like any other Sunday, and my friends, Mike and Nick, turned up. Actually, they're policemen. And they called in to uh, warn me. It was a friendly warning, you know, that um, I needed to take this new Sunday law seriously. I mean, you know, they mentioned that it was a law that was enforced by the government and um, that it was good for the community and the country to have this one day set aside. You know, when they left, I listened to them out, you know. But when they left, man, was I angry. A law that's actually stripping our liberty of conscience and freedom of choice. Who is behind this, is what I asked back then. I had been booked into a by the lands tour and a friend of ours or a friend of the family, um, Professor Fletcher, had encouraged me to meet up with Jim Aravita. He was a history researcher. Mr. Aravita? Yeah. You've been expecting me. Oh, you must be the one that uh, Professor... Fletcher. That's right, Fletcher. Listen, there's no way we can talk around here. Why don't we go someplace that's a little quieter? Follow me. But Professor Fletcher warned me that Jim may be reluctant to actually take me on because he feared his own life while researching this information on this particular Sunday law. Now, how long have you been looking for me? Two weeks. Two weeks. I'm sorry. I hope you haven't wasted your time. I hope not. Now, let's get down to business. Now. My name no. is Dave. No, don't mention your name, whatever you do. I'm sure that we're under surveillance here. Surveillance? Yes, there's a fellow been following me. Um, I'm going to have to give you a fictitious name so we can talk. How about Terry? Is that okay? Now, Terry, what is it you think I can do for you? Well, I want to come with you on this research on the new law. No, it's absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. Why not? I can be of a lot of help. And company. No, it's not that. I'm, I'm sure I could use the company to help. It's just that this particular project is dangerous and I've got to do it alone. Terry, there's something you don't understand. Something that I'm just beginning to understand. And that's how dangerous thing is. That, you know, it, this isn't just a traffic ticket. 
this isn't even a federal offense type of thing. What it is is, is an international power that would think nothing of just destroying you and your family. The prosecution may now present its opening remark. Thank you, Your Honor. This case involves one of the most important developments in the modern age, where God can be brought into law and order. The insidious spread of lawlessness, terrorism and immorality has been tearing society apart. It is now time for the citizen to be accountable to a higher power. Only in this way can society hope to alleviate its ills. The primary purpose of Sunday legislation is to create social cohesion. Your Honour, the family has disintegrated before our eyes. It is the single most important reason why we have so much crime and social disruption. Our politicians and religious leaders have united together to provide our citizens with a stable and just society. We cannot have this process undermined by minority groups or individuals such as David Bannister. It is our civic duty to give our full support to this vital initiative. Listen, Terry, I'll take you on on one condition, and that is if I have to ask you to do anything, or even if I have to ask you to go home, you'll do it without any question. Is that understood? Thank you, Mr. Arabia. Don't thank me too soon. Italy and I wanted to go and watch a game of soccer you know and um, but I always found that Jim always protected his day of worship and I have to respect him for that and as this trip went on and on and on I started to see that um, why he was protecting his day and he didn't force that on me I had a choice I could have gone to the soccer game uh, but for him, he just always said, well, you know, maybe on Sunday um, would be a better day for him. You ready? Yep, ready as I'll ever be. Where are we off to today? Well, today we're going to go to one of the oldest and the largest of the ancient Italian churches. Hey Jim, this is not the Vatican. No, this is the Chiesa Valdesi. It's a descendant of the Waldensian Church. We can talk about that later. Let's go over and have a look at it, shall we? Why don't you wait here for a minute? Look at this mosaic over the door, see what you can make out of that. And I'm going to step in here for a minute. I can't make anything of it. Well, let's just step over to the park. We can't talk here. And I'll tell you what it means. Remember the candle on it? Mm. That candle represents the Chiesa Valdesi, or the Waldensian Church. The candlestick represents the church itself, while the book underneath it represents the Bible. The seven stars over the top of it represent the seven valleys of the Waldenses in the mountains that we're going to visit. What about the writing? Well, one of the words was lux, the second one was lucid, and the third one was tenebras. Lux means the light, lucid means to shine, and tenebris means darkness. So it means the light that shines in darkness. 
You see, the Waldensian church continued to teach the truths of the Bible throughout the period of the Dark Ages when it was outlawed. And that's what that whole symbol represents. Did you get what you wanted? Boy, I sure did, Terry. Look at these. I got two authoritative books on the history of the two branches of Christianity and the war going on between them. Two branches? Yeah, there's two branches of Christianity. You see, in the early centuries of Christianity, the church broke into two different movements. Um, each one had their own Bible. Each one had their own doctrines. And each one of them had their own way of dealing with people who disagreed with them. In fact, one of those branches, Terry, is responsible for this law and for your arrest. Which one? Well, you study what they teach, and you study what they do, and you compare it to the Bible. And then, Terry, you'll have to come to your own conclusions on that, because that's what we're here for. Listen, I'd like to take you over to the, um, the Roman Forum, and while we're there, I'll explain a few things to you. Would the prosecution now present the charges against David Bannister? David Bannister has repeatedly ignored the importance of Sunday legislation by continuing his work activities on Sunday and thereby offends the sensitivities of his God-fearing neighbours and community. The prosecution demands that David Bannister receive an appropriate penalty for his disruptive behaviour in breaking this law. Defence? Your Honour, David Bannister here is no criminal. He has no criminal record whatsoever. He's a good, hard-working citizen. The defense will simply demonstrate that this is an antiquated law. It has no relevance to society whatever, and it ought to be abolished. In determining a fair judgment for Mr. Bannister, I expect counsel to not stray from the facts of the case. The historic issues of this case are far too complex for this small community court to solve. I expect counsel to tread very carefully. Yeah, I drifted in and out of different uh, feelings. Being overwhelmed with a sense of purpose. Yet, other times, it defied all common sense. Boy, this place is something, isn't it? Yeah. You know why I brought you here, Terry? Huh? Well, I mentioned back there at the Chiesa Valdezzi that there were two branches of Christianity in the early centuries. One of them was Roman Christianity. You know what that one was? You mean Catholicism? Yes, Catholicism. That's the largest uh, family of Christianity. Well, before we can understand Roman Christianity, we really have to understand the mind and the culture that it grew up in. And that was this, Rome. Now if you noticed as we, you know, we went along through the forum there that there were many different types of architecture. I showed you the Doric columns and the Ionic and the Corinthian columns and the domes. You know, the domes came from as far away as Syria. And the pillars originated in Assyria and Persia. And uh, the layout of many of these temples came from Egypt. Every one of these things was borrowed from another part of the world. Hmm. It was just the, the Roman mind was an eclectic mind. What's that? Well, eclecticism is uh, the quality of absorbing everything, uniting everything. And this was the secret of her power. She could absorb the religions and concepts of the nations that she went into, and they would feel comfortable with Romanism, oh, you see. I see. Now, her streets became filled with business people and merchants and religious leaders and thinkers from all over the world. She became a great center of culture. And so you can see why these, um, the various religious cults wanted the heads of their priesthoods to reside in Rome. 
And I'll tell you, the Roman Caesar was happy about that because, you see, that's a way of winning the hearts of people by absorbing their religions or paying honor to it. I mean, even the Hebrews, which the Romans had a little bit of a dislike for, uh, Caesar embellished their temple and sent great blocks of marble there and money, you know, to fill it with gold and beautiful artistry and stuff. Mm. Well, she did that with all the religions. The religious priests controlled the people. And as long as Rome kept control of the religious priests, she had control of everything, you see. Now, if you go around Rome, you'll see places where there have been excavations of uh, Mithraic temples. Mithraism became probably the most popular religion in the Roman world. It was Persian sun worship. It developed about the time of Daniel, and it borrowed heavily from the Hebrew scriptures and united it with the old Persian sun worship. Like the Hebrew religion, it adopted a seventh day as a Sabbath. Well, that particular day of worship was Sunday, you see. Now, what it did was it called Sunday the day of Mithra, or the day of the Lord, or the Lord's day. And that's how in Romanism it became known as the Dominical day, or the Sunday, or the, uh, the day of the Lord. Now, another religion that became very popular in Rome was a religion called the cult of Isis from Egypt. And so all over Rome you find these little images of a mother and a child. Mother worship was very common in the Roman Empire at that time. Then another religion that actually I believe subtly behind the scenes became the most powerful uh, was a religion that came all the way from Babylon. Babylon? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a kingdom that was established 2,000 years before the time of Christ. But it was the most pervasive system of religion. And when the Persians conquered Neo-Babylon, these priests fled to, Greek, uh, to the Greek Empire, to a place called Pergamum. And then from Pergamum, in about 133, the last of the kings there, he was called Attalus III, bequeathed the entire priesthood of these Babylonian priests that were hiding under the facade of Greek religion, he bequeathed a whole bunch of them to Rome. And within a hundred years, they became the cult of the Caesars. Now, these people worshipped the number 666. They worshipped the sun. They worshipped the mother of God. They worshipped, uh, they used holy water. They had priesthoods. They had, and you know what they called their chief priest? They called him Pontifus Maximus. And you see, that's what we've seen on some of these uh, inscriptions. That was a title he used for Caesar. Well, he adopted all these symbols of the sun god you see around him. Yeah. Now, now you, 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 can, you can capture the feeling that Rome was the great capital of powerful pagan idolatry. And it was very willing to absorb other pagan religions as long as it increased the power of Rome. But what was happening was when the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles. A new power was breathed into humanity. And divinity and humanity combined started a powerful movement that could not be stopped no matter what. And unlike any other kind of religion, it proselytized among the pagans. The goal was to win people from paganism. Well, of course, that alarmed the various priesthoods, and they began to persecute Christians. And that alarmed, of course, the Roman rulers. They began to persecute Christians. You see, these pagan priests believed that if Christianity was to be left unchecked, it would eventually destroy everything. It would destroy the kingdom. It would destroy their power. Let me read a quotation from this, the research that I've been gathering that might be interesting, and it adds more weight to this thing. It says, Paganism foresaw that should the gospel triumph, her temples and altars would be swept away. Therefore, she summoned all her forces to destroy Christianity. Christians were stripped of their possessions. They were driven from their homes. Great numbers sealed their testimony with their blood. Noble and slave alike, rich and poor, learned and ignorant, were alike slain without any mercy. That's frightening. They were leaving the empty religion of paganism and accepting something that filled their hearts and gave them something to live for, you see. And so the persecution didn't stop them. Listen to this tremendous quotation. It says here, God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread and increase. Said a Christian, you may kill us, torture us, condemn us, 
Your injustice is proof that we are innocent. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we will grow. The blood of martyr is seed. And Terry, as we face this law, we need that kind of strength, courage, and experience. That's one of the reasons why we need to study out this subject. Not only to realize the, uh, the movements that led to persecution be before, but what Christians need to have as an inner experience or an inner strength. Now, I'd like to take you to the site where many Christians lost their lives in horrible ways, the Colosseum. Why don't Let's we go. go over there? Let's go. Your Honor, surely this isn't a law that can be enforced. This so-called noble effort to bring people together under God is no different from religious dictatorship. Setting up a basis for compulsory worship is in conflict with the most basic principle of Christian ethics. By that I mean that every individual should choose their beliefs according to the dictates of their conscience. And furthermore, if we're going to continue to refer to God's day of worship in the court, my client does not acknowledge Sunday, but rather Saturday, the seventh day of the week, as his official day of worship. There it is, Terry. Wow, that is impressive. It's something, isn't it? It's a symbol of the Roman Empire. At the same time, it's a symbol of the suffering and persecution of God's people through the centuries. When did the pagans start this persecution? Well, it really began in full about the time of Nero, which was about 60 AD. And then Christians were accused of everything. Every time there was a calamity of land and sea, every time a terrible storm came up and crops were destroyed, the Christians got blamed for it. Yeah. And as a result, they were thrown in these arenas and uh, died in terrible ways. They even accused them of treason against the government because they wouldn't offer incense to Caesar. They were accused of being atheists and the enemies of all religion because they didn't believe in the pagan gods and they wouldn't bow down to pagan images. Great numbers of Christians were thrown to wild beasts. Yeah? Yeah. The amphitheaters were often the location of seeing these people dying as entertainment. You know, a lot of times they, they wrapped them up in animal skins and then let wild dogs loose on them to tear them apart. Huh. Or they crucified them right there in the arena and set up great bonfires to burn up scores of Christians at a time. At other times, we read that they...
David Bannister refuses to accept the community's consensus concerning How the sanctity of Sunday. this is community consensus? Let the prosecution continue. At a time when social stability is of paramount importance, the actions of David Bannister compromise the safety we all seek under God. Your Honour, I'm surprised the prosecution is serious about defending the state's right to suppress freedom of conscience. The consequences, to say the least, are alarming. Surely we can't keep removing civil liberties in order to deal with crime. This initiative just appears to be a knee-jerk reaction to fear and to superstition, and it threatens to throw the whole law process back into the Dark Ages. Your Honour, Sunday legislation represents the will of the people. If it means sacrificing a few civil liberties for the greater good, then we as a community should pull together rather than disrupt the honourable intent behind this law. Honourable intent? This so-called honourable intent is loosely based on tradition rather than on the interpretation of God's word. Can an accurate interpretation be determined by so-called democratic processes, which in this case is reduced to a reaction to anarchy and to terrorism? This is the Trabia. Look at here on the map. This is the river that the Celts traveled along to establish the college in Bobbio that we're going to. Come on. Isn't it beautiful? It's just another village. We saw heaps of them on the way up the mountains. That's not just another village. Anyway, what do you see? I see bears pulling plows. Bears? Yeah. And, and I see, see young, powerful men selling trees and splitting up the logs and building a school. I see students with uh, leather satchels over their shoulder going to class at the oratory. And over here I see a scriptorium. I see young scholars copying manuscripts of the Bible to give to the people of Europe. And then all over these mountains and valleys I see beautiful fields of ripening harvests. Has this got anything to do with that invisible church? Hang on, I know why it's invisible. It's all in your head. Okay, maybe now it's in my head, Terry. But it wasn't in the 6th and 7th century. It was a very real scene back then. Well, who were these people? They were Irish Christians from the ends of the earth. And they had come to bring Christianity and education to the people of Europe. Okay, you got my curiosity. But go slow. This history is new to me. Listen, why don't we talk as we walk across the bridge? There's some things I want to show you in town. Okay. Terry, this town, so far from those noisy towns and cities of Europe, was once the intellectual center of northern Italy. Before this place, there was no school here for the young people. Not one child in a hundred could even write his own name. These wonderful Celtic missionaries, the builders of this school, reached this spot in the wilderness after they had established hundreds of other schools throughout the mountains and the valleys of Europe. They would already laid a foundation of education in other places. You know, this might be hard for you to believe, Terry, but it was these Christians not the Roman Christians. 
these young men felling the trees and building their schools, copying the Bible for their scriptoriums that raised the minds of the people of Europe to a much higher level. They laid the foundation for what you see in modern civilization today. They believed in the Bible as their absolute authority. And they saw Christ as the only mediator between God and man. The government has confirmed to make the Lord's Day an official day of rest and worship. Surely the defence is not suggesting that we ignore our own government. It's our democratic right, Your Honour, to oppose laws that are unjust. Therefore, it's my intention to prove to this court that not only is this law unjust, but the bold interpretation of Sunday being God's holy day is erroneous. It's based on centuries of ignorance. You know, Your Honour, one would question also whether there's in fact a covert religious agenda behind the reconstitution of laws that enforce a particular ideology. Counsel, sidebar please. Counsel, I prefer this not head into a theological discussion. The court can't be used to discuss doctrine. Please return to your seats. The court will recess for one hour. Meanwhile, I would like to see counsel in my chambers immediately. Look, before this becomes a circus, I would like to hear the arguments develop a degree of relevancy to community law rather than a theological debate. Are you able to summarise the essence of the defence's case for me? Yes, Your Honour. The defence is based on two principles. Number one, the right of citizens to exercise freedom of conscience in all matters relating to religious beliefs and practices. And number two, there's no basis for Sunday legislation that identifies Sunday as the true day of worship. Your Honour, I realise that both aspects of my case involve a religious debate, and you request in the courtroom that this be avoided. But I just don't see how I can structure a fair defence if I'm unable to address what is in fact a religious matter. This law was constituted by a religious organisation, and so this case will need to involve a degree of religious discussion. Go on, then. As I've mentioned, the issue of the correct day of worship has been argued for thousands of years. So, what do you believe is the problem with Sunday legislation other than the theological problem? The problem with Sunday legislation, Your Honour, is that it's an aggressive religious law that negates the right of choice. If this law is permitted to convict our client, then every freedom derived from the democratic processes is really up for review. Governments of free societies should never legislate in matters of church doctrine. What we're faced with now is having to incorporate theological exposition right in the courtroom, which has the inherent emotional mixture of uh, religion and civil law. Let's get down to business on this other branch of Christianity. It begins with the Jews. The Jews were scattered all over the world. At first, 700 years before the time of Christ, and then with the Babylonians, about 600 years before the time of Christ. The Jews had been scattered along the trade routes. The great nations of the world had taken Jewish communities and placed them on their outer borders of their kingdoms in order to, to build up society. What they wanted to do was protect their borders from the invasions of other tribes. And because of this, the Jews became very, very prominent. They became great traders, and they always educated their children well, so they were highly cultured. When Jesus told the apostles to go out, he told them to go first to the lost of the tribe of Israel. 
And so already there was a foundation for Christianity around the whole world. Now, the Christian movement was powerful. During the first century, Christianity went to the entire inhabited globe. Now, I know people don't realize that today, but it was a big movement. Because the world was broken up into major family or, or language groups, Christianity was broken up into a Greek-speaking group, a, um, a Jewish Christian group. It was also had a Gaelic-speaking group. That's the, the Celtic people later to be the Irish and the Welsh and the Scottish and the French. And then there was a, another group, the Latin group. Hang on. Two branches. How come you're mentioning more? Well, yeah, but that comes later. There are five branches of ethnic Christianity, but they were all one great church. From Ireland all the way through Asia, they all believed the same things. Listen, in the first few centuries of Christianity... They all basically believed the same thing. So you only had one Christian church at first. The church split over the issue of power primarily. And that was in the 4th century during the time of Constantine. Now the Apostle Paul evangelized Greeks and Latins. And he also evangelized the Gaelic people. You've heard of the book of Galatians in the Bible? Mm. Okay, well the Galatians were the Celtic people. And they had relatives all the way from Mongolia across the globe to the islands of Britain and France and Gaul and Spain, you see. So when he evangelized these people, they loved Paul. They thought he was really special. And they began to tell their relatives about it. And for years, missionaries came from Asia Minor, from Ephesus, and went to Gaul, where the rest of the Gaelic people were. And they spread Christianity right up into the British Isles. So by the end of the second centuries, there were... Christian communities all across the globe. That was just one branch. The Jews, when, uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed, went over Jordan into a place called Decapolis. And a hundred years later, they migrated up to northern Syria, which was Antioch. Antioch became kind of the great missionary headquarters of the church. And in time, those Syrian Christians, which some historians have called the Waldenses of the East, brought the knowledge of Christ to almost all the nations of Asia, all the way to Japan. Yes, this, is, um, this has actually changed my life incredibly. <laughs> there was a, a world of information out there that I was ignorant to, and I had no understanding of history. And uh, at first I wondered whether I'd be overwhelmed with all this information and whether I'd go home, just give up. But as time went on, I started to see that there was a bigger picture to um, this whole issue of the Sunday Law and actually who was behind it. Well, go on then. The lessons of history should remind us how dangerous it is for society to support the union of the church with the state. Over the centuries, literally millions of people have been slaughtered because of a religio-political initiative that arbitrarily attempted to impose religion on the masses. Those who didn't submit to the church's dogmas and laws, including this law, were identified as the vilest of heretics and they were sentenced to death just because their religious convictions conflicted with a church under the control of a state or a state under the control of the church. Surely you're not suggesting that society would allow this to occur again? And that if it occurred like you say it has? And surely you're not for one moment suggesting that it didn't happen? Imposing penalties for failing to observe Sunday legislation is a violation of one's conscience. Whenever a state imposes a penalty for complying with a law that doesn't exist outside religion, the state really, Your Honour, is engaged in religious persecution. Civilised communities should resist any attempt on the part of governments to enforce what is effectively a state religion that compromises our religious liberties. Look, my responsibility in this court does not concern the history of religion. 
It is concerned, however, with whether or not your client has engaged in behaviour against the community's interest and the law. I understand that, Your Honour, but the history behind Sunday legislation is relevant to the prosecution's case because those who want Sunday protected actually argue from history. The truth is, Your Honour, I cannot provide my client with adequate defence unless the court is willing to examine the historical premise on which Sunday legislation is based. Only then can we ascertain what might happen to be against community interests. Mm. Mm. I know we don't, we don't hear about this in history, but it's true. They could count their converts by the millions. The Syrian Christian Church was the largest church that ever existed on the face of the earth, bigger than the Catholic or the Latin and the Greek church combined. Now, at the same time, they were spreading in the East the Gaelic branch of Christianity, the Galatians, remember in the Bible, that had been evangelized by the Apostle Paul. So they had his theology, apostolic theology. They were evangelizing their relatives all the way through Europe to the British Isles. And then in the 3rd and the 4th century, we read about Christian missions being set up in Wales and Ireland. In the 4th century, you heard about a man named Patrick, mm. St. Patrick of mm. Ireland. Well, he was one of these early Gaelic Christian Christians. He evangelized the Irish kings and set up schools all throughout Ireland. And these young people, they studied for 18 years. They studied Greek, Hebrew, Latin. Some of these schools had three to 7,000 students in it. Ireland was called the University Island. Mm -hmm. And people from all over Europe sent their children to Ireland in order to get an education. Well, in time, some of the kings of Europe invited Irish missionaries to come into the forests of Europe to set up schools here in Europe so they wouldn't have to send their children so far away. And they invited a man from Ireland, a man by the name of Columbano. And now you know where Columbanus came from. Well, at first he worked in France and set up schools there. And then he and his missionary friends made their way through the Alps of Switzerland and into the valleys of Europe. He was pursued by the Roman Church for a period of time and given protection by kings in Lombardy. Finally, he was given an area of the forest down here in southern Lombardy to establish his last school. And like I said, it became the great intellectual center of Italy. In fact, at the time of his death, in 615, they found that the library here contained um, representation of every branch of knowledge known in his day. Listen, these men literally changed the world that they lived in and gave us the quality of life that we have today. Otherwise, you can just imagine what things would be like if, if uh, education was suppressed like it was during the Dark Ages. Now, the Gaelic Christians of the West and the Syrian Christians of the East uh, through the centuries met in conventions up here in these very mountains and it became a great Christian center and it was never connected with Rome. Rome didn't conquer this area until a thousand years later. The Roman church called them the uh, Valdesi or the Waldenses or the people of the valleys. Remember the church in, in Rome? When we started our trip. Oh, yeah. The Chiesa Valdesi. Yeah. That's the branch of Christianity that we need to study next. The reason is, is because in the early years, the Roman church wasn't organized to fight the church well. Her evangelism spread all over Europe. But beginning in about the 12th century, Innocent III established something called the Inquisition. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from 60 to 200 million people lost their lives during that time period. For 400 years, the Christian church in Europe received one death blow after another, but she kept rising to the fight all the way to the Reformation. Now, those crucial 400 years are where you and I are going to get a perspective on this warfare between this church in the wilderness and the great Roman church. And I really think we ought to be in the Waldensy Valleys for that discussion. What do you say we head up in that direction? Okay.
compulsory legislation was first instigated by the Roman Emperor Constantine in 321 AD. He was supported by many of the bishops at the time. And one of them, Eusebius, who by the way happened to be a very close friend of the emperors, came forward with the teaching that Jesus had changed the Sabbath to Sunday, but he produced no scriptural support to back up his new teaching. That's completely untrue. Look, it's my understanding that Sunday sacredness has always been a Christian teaching. And so it has, Your Honour. It is common knowledge that the Jewish Sabbath was done away with at the time of Christ's death. Also, according to the New Testament, Christians worshipped on the first day of the week to celebrate Christ's resurrection. And that's easy to prove from Scripture. Let me read from Acts 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight, unquote. Surely this is clear biblical evidence of the validity of Sunday worship in the New Testament. Defence, isn't this clear to you? No, Your Honour, not at all. We're simply told that Paul met with his companions on Saturday night to break bread. And breaking of bread in Bible times just meant simply sharing a meal together. We even still use that term from time to time today. The text simply says that Paul was leaving his companions on Sunday morning and so they had a last fellowship farewell meal together on Saturday night, ready for Paul's departure the next day. In those days, Saturday night was the beginning of the first day of the week, for the Jews kept their days from sunset. So really what this text is saying is that Paul and his companions met together for a last fellowship meal. Paul preached on till midnight. A young man fell out of the window and Paul raised him to life again. And then he kept preaching till the morning and he left at daybreak to walk 30 kilometers to the next town, Asos. Now, he would not have traveled that distance if he felt that Sunday was a very special holy day. Okay, prosecution. Do you have any other biblical evidence to prove that Sunday is the correct day of worship? The Bible was still being written when the change to Sunday occurred, so the evidence is incomplete. However, it has been accepted by most Christian authorities that the apostles observed the first day of the week in commemoration of the resurrection. Throughout history, the Sunday Sabbath has been embraced by the Christian church as a whole, and that's not a fact that anyone can deny. The defence mistakenly believes that the Jewish Sabbath is a Christian Sabbath. Well, you appear to have history on your side, but it isn't clear that you have biblical support. church in a place like this. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, Jim, it's about time you laid it out for me. You've been holding back on me on this information about the Sunday law. And you said once we got up here in the hills, you'd tell me all about it. And I want to know more now. I've been pretty quiet up till now. And another thing I want to ask you too, those books that you've been referring to, how do I know that they're true? How can I believe them? I figured you might get a little more serious with me after a while. But the thing is, I felt like I really needed to show you a few things before I could 
get down to the more serious side of things. And you'll have to admit, passing through the Vatican had a real effect on you. Yeah. And gaining an understanding of the early Christian church from the Gaelic perspective, establishing education in Europe, that added a whole perspective to Christian history you didn't know before. No. And now I think you pretty much see that there are two branches of Christianity. So, let's get down to the issues. I'll ask you a few questions. What if it was proved to the satisfaction of the public that there was an older and purer Christian church datable back to the apostles and that it wasn't the Roman church? How does that make the Roman church appear? And what if it could be shown that these primitive Christians, the Waldenses in this case, had an older and purer Bible. Now what does that do to the Bible of the Roman church? It makes it look like a fraud again. You see? If this church could be traced back to the time of the apostles, then it makes it clear that the Catholic church is the heretic. You see what I mean? We have a Sunday law because socially it appears to be appropriate to close businesses and to shut down work on Sunday, a Christian holiday. But what if Sunday wasn't a Christian holiday? What if Sunday was simply a sign of the Roman Church's authority? Why then the whole thing is a fraud. And the legislators would have to go right back to their books again. The Roman Church has tried to make it appear that the Waldenses were a small church and originated in the 12th century. In this way, they can avoid the accusation that they're the heretic, you see. Not only that, they broke up the, uh, uh, the primitive church under many different names, such as Passagini, uh, Valdenses, and the Bogomils. You know where the word uh, boogeyman came from. It came from Bogomil. And um, the name Voodoo came from the word Voudois, which was a, a name of the Waldenses. They also gave them other names like Sabati, in Sabati, a Baptist, Anabaptists, and uh, Paulicians, and Petributians, and Henricians, and on and on and on, to make it look like there were many different little groups, when in fact they were one vast religion that was older and purer than the Roman Church. Your Honor, the Jews were the recipients of God's blessings and they were the guardians of the Word of God. But they were not the first to introduce the Seventh-day Sabbath as our prosecution has been suggesting. It began actually at creation. In Genesis 2 and verse 3 the Bible says on the seventh day God ended his work. That was the work of creation of course. And it says he rested on the seventh day from all the work, and then he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The Sabbath then existed for thousands of years before there were any Jews. And it's important to notice two words in that verse. He blessed and he sanctified. You see, he blessed the seventh day. That means God put a blessing in the seventh day, that he didn't put in the first day or any other day of the week. And then he sanctified it. He set it apart for a holy use. So the Sabbath, therefore, was very important to God. And that's why many Christians down through the centuries have also looked on this as a day to be honoured, as does my client today. I'd like to see where that's written in the Bible. It makes a very clear distinction in the Ten Commandments. The Fourth Commandment says that God's people are to work six days and they're to rest on the seventh day. There's no other meaning to the seventh day at all beside that. And doesn't it concern our prosecution that it's the only commandment that begins with the word remember? 
Eight of the others begin with thou shalt not, and one begins with honour your parents. But this one re begins with remember. Let me quote it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, wait a minute. Where do you find that? It's in the second book, Exodus 20 and verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, the fourth commandment, Your Honor, refers to the seventh day of the week, not Sunday. And these are literal days, not symbolic days. Days of the week back there originally were numbered, not named. So it was not Sunday, but was the first day. Not Tuesday, the third day. Not Monday, the sec second day. Not Saturday, the seventh day. The seventh day Sabbath is a part of the law that Jesus came to fulfill and to uphold. In another place in the Bible, in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. And that Greek word there, fulfill, means fully to preach. In another verse in the book of Isaiah, it said he came to magnify the law. That means to bring it out in a better and richer and fuller light. And then he goes on here to say, Verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall in any wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And respectfully, Your Honor, the last time I looked, heaven and earth hadn't passed away. They're still here. And yet Christians keep nine of the Ten Commandments but the only one that commences with remember is the one they seem to forget. And this principle is clearly understood by a court of law. We must keep the law in full, not in part. And that's an issue not overlooked by my prosecution friend here in relation to a case against my client. Interesting, the Bible itself takes up the same issue in James 2, Verse 19, whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one point, he's guilty of all. You see, the problem arises when a conflict comes between God's law and the law of the land. And the Bible says in that case, in Acts 5.29, if you want the verse, we ought to obey God rather than man. And, Your Honor, the defendant has sought to resort to a higher power in this particular instance. Yeah, many of the recent terrorists are take, use the same argument, Your Honour. We're hardly dealing with terroristic behaviour, Your Honour. The divine law says, six days shall you labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And my client has observed this law to the full. He's worked hard for six days, which is more than a lot of people do today, and he's kept the seventh day Sabbath. It seems ludicrous that he stands to be prosecuted over this very thing. The defence fails to realise that if Christians were meant to observe the fourth commandment, then Christ would have specifically mentioned it in the New Testament, in the same way he told the people to observe the other nine commandments. Where exactly did Jesus say, Thou shalt not covet? It's not anywhere in the Bible. And that second commandment about images, making of images for worship, you won't find that in the New Testament either. And yet most Protestants accept that that second commandment is still binding. I suggest the prosecution is on very shaky ground. Very, very shaky ground. If she continues to build her argument on what Jesus didn't say. Now this involves the delusion that Christ changed the Sabbath to Sunday as the official day of worship. He didn't say that. It's not anywhere here in the Bible, Your Honour. Rather, Christ did say that he didn't come to destroy the law, but if he'd changed the Sabbath or abolished it, he would have been destroying the law. The New Testament takes for granted that God's moral law is still binding. The Apostle Paul clearly taught that the commandments 
were still binding in his day. For example, in Romans seven twelve in the Bible, he said, The law is holy, and the commandment is holy, it's just, and it's good. You see, the New Testament encourages believers to adopt the spirit of obedience. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he did tell us how it should be kept. For example, on the Sabbath, he supported healing. He told us it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath day, but he opposed making the Sabbath a burden by surrounding it with extra laws and regulations like the Jews did. And we must remember that Paul wrote this down about the law being holy 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your Honour, the Christian church is now under a new covenant. Many of the issues the defence raises relate mostly to the old covenant. It is the informed position amongst Christian scholars that when Christ was crucified, he nailed all those old ordinances and laws to the cross. I quote Colossians 2 verse 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Then in verse 16, Let no man judge you in meat and drink, or in respect to a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Talk about freedom and liberty. This is what Christ came to do for us to set us free from the demands of the Jewish laws. The Waldenses had an older Bible, a Bible that's traceable way back to the early Vulgate, or a Bible that was called the Itala, dated clear back to the second century. The Roman Catholic Bible, a Bible that we call the, uh, the Latin Vulgate, originated in the fifth century. So you can see the Waldenses had an earlier Bible. If they had an earlier Bible, then what was the Bible after it that was different? It has to be a mutilation of Scripture, a fraud. And there again she's indicted for having a false Bible. If the Waldenses could trace her history to the Apostles, then the Roman Church has to be the heretic. And you can see why she'd be willing to destroy their records to destroy their lands and to alter the concepts of history to protect herself. As far as documentation is concerned, that's a little bit more difficult. But remember, we've got hundreds of years here of falsifications of records, of destroying the records. And actually, the history of this church, we get primarily from Catholic records. For instance, I have a book here that mentions an author by the name of Renarius. And Renarius was a Roman Catholic inquisitor. He had originally been a Waldensee. He had apostatized from the Catholic or from the Waldensian Church, and after years of training, he became one of the leading enemies against it. So he knew something about it. And then, on, while he was investigating the uh, the Waldenses for the papacy, he came out with studies that mentions their supreme antiquity. Listen to this. Now, I'm not quoting from one historian here, but from a group of historians. It says here from the history book of Samuel Edger, the Waldenses, as they were ancient, were also numerous. Now, see, that's news. We always thought there were little tiny groups of heretics. Vignier, a French historian, quotes from other historians. See, a lot of the books have been destroyed, so we have to go to history books today that, that uh, quote from older books that were available in the time period of the historian. Vignier gives a high idea of their populousness. The Waldenses, says this author, multiplied wonderfully in France as well as in the other countries of Christendom. They had many patrons in Germany, France, Italy, and especially Lombardy, notwithstanding the papal exertions for their extirpation. This sect, says Nangish, was infinite in number. A peer, says Renarius, and this is that fellow I was telling you about, in nearly every country. Multiplied, says Sanderis, another Roman Catholic historian, through all lands. Infected, says Caesarius, a thousand cities. And spread their contagion, says Syconius, through almost the whole Latin world. Scarcely any region, says Gretzer, remained free and untainted from this pestilence. That means it covered all of Europe. 
So it was a very large church at one time, bigger than historians have led us to believe. Now you might wonder, you know, why I believe this unpopular history when it's more popular to believe the other. Well, I believe that, that if people would take the time to investigate the real facts of history, they would find that there's a whole different history of the Walden Seas than has been given by the Roman Church. But remember, the Roman Church has had hundreds of years to destroy the records of the Walden Seas and to rewrite history. All a person has to do is know a little bit about the Roman Catholic movement to change history and to defend herself, and you wouldn't depend upon any of your historical material. Look at this. At times my brain was just so overloaded with information. I mean, Jim was speaking about a completely different world that I had no understanding of. And I found it hard at times to digest everything. This tells about the destruction of, uh, of the books. This is from a historian named Babiani. He says, unfortunately, many of these books were lost during the persecutions of the 17th century, and only those books and ancient documents sent to the libraries of Cambridge and Geneva by Pastor Ledger were preserved. Now, even some of those documents have been stolen since that time. These papists took care after every persecution to destroy as much of the Waldensian literature as possible. Many of the barbs were learned men and well-versed in the languages and the science of Scripture. It's such a terrible tragedy when you realize their libraries were destroyed. You know today the Waldensian people don't even know their own history. They've been infiltrated so much and they have had historians rise up among them and present the Catholic view of their own history. And now they've organically united with the Methodist Church. And the result has been that they're ecumenical. And they actually promote the ecumenical movement. They've lost the Protestant spirit. They've lost the vision of the past. And it's such a tragedy. What happened was that for many centuries, um, the papacy could do little to stop the Waldenses. After the terrible destruction of the Albigenses in the, the 13th century, um, the papacy found it more and more difficult to get the monarchies of Europe to help them in crusades against these people. And so there was almost 200 years there of peace. But in the middle of the 15th century, there was a tremendous crusade to destroy them. And because of it, the, many of the people were destroyed in the valleys and uh, they fled into the mountains further and further in. And the Walden Seas were, were restricted to the valleys that you and I are visiting here on this trip. Now, in these valleys... Year after year, their children would be kidnapped, their wives would disappear when on their way to market, or their husbands would disappear when going to the valleys for work. They would be taken off to Torino to face the Inquisition, and many of them lost their lives being tortured to death. The children were taken off to, um, to monasteries to be raised as Roman Catholics. And at times they weren't allowed to even own or purchase land. So what many of the Waldensee families did is they went to the priest and they went ahead and took the Mass and they went to church on Sunday and they confessed to the priest. And when they did all these things faithfully, the priest would give them a certificate that would indicate that they were good Catholics. Then they would keep their Waldensian Bible hidden. Go ahead and go to services at the Catholic Church on Sunday. They would take Mass and they would go to confessional. And when they did this faithfully, then a Catholic priest would give them a certificate and as long as they carried that certificate of uh, cooperation with them, then they would be allowed to travel unmolested and carry out their business. But you can't compromise without destroying something inside. And as a result, Waldensianism began to die. It was only a little bit of flicker. They would still go listen to their Waldensian pastors, and they would keep their Bibles hidden. And many of them for years continued this sort of half Christianity, this hidden Christianity. I think they lost a lot of their doctrinal foundations during that time. They certainly lost the old spirit of the Waldenses, the great evangelistic movement that we look back to with so much pride. But you know, um, at the dawn of the period of the Reformation, the Waldenses were, uh, they weren't a fraction of what they were before. They were no longer really evangelical, and um, 
they stayed in their valleys and they weren't allowed to buy land outside their valleys. It was a degenerate church. They clung to a culture and a history, but that's about all they had. But there were rumors that there was tremors taking place in Europe, that a, a revolution was taking place within the Catholic Church called the Reformation, and that whole countries had taken a stand on the side of these Protestants or Protestants. The Waldenses sent delegates out to other parts of Europe to gather uh, material, some books or whatever they could find as to what these Protestants were teaching, and they brought them back to their pastors in the valleys. And after studying these things out, they decided that they wanted um, a closer investigation, they wanted to talk to these people, and possibly merge with them. Well, it's interesting, when the Protestants realized the supreme antiquity of the Waldenses, once studying their beliefs, the Protestants, which were young upstarts, chastised the Waldenses for compromising. That's interesting, isn't it? It's like the generations today, many of the young people finding the old books on Christianity and beginning to really study their Bible will chastise the older Protestants for their failure and their compromise in this day and age. It was an easy step then for the Waldenses to join the Reformation and even set aside more of their historical forms and doctrines. They... They invited um, Waldenses or Albigenses from the other side of the mountains in France and from other parts of Europe to join them in this meeting at a place called Chanferan. And they also invited representatives from the Reformation to come. In fact, you know, Chanferan is just up the road here. And maybe I'll tell you the rest of this story when we get there at the monument. The prosecution claims that God's law, the Ten Commandments, is actually a Jewish law and as such was done away with when Christ came to pay the sacrifice for sins. Your Honor, I feel it necessary to present some facts about the Old and New Covenants that the prosecution seems to keep referring to. I will allow that. The prosecution seems to be <laughs> suggesting that anything the Jews were involved in is not applicable to the Christian world. Does that mean that we should reject this Bible because it was written almost entirely by Jews. And more to the point, the prosecution refers to the Jewish Sabbath as irrelevant because the Jews kept the seventh day of the week. And yet, really, the Bible says it was for all. Let me quote Jesus, for instance, in Mark 2, 27 and 28. He said, The Sabbath was made for man. And my English upbringing and my English learning in school prevents me from ever pronouncing M-A-N Jew. I just can't do it. M-A-N is man every time. Mankind. The Sabbath was made for the whole human family. In the Old Testament, and in particular Leviticus, God gave his people ceremonial laws and practices to teach them how he was dealing with the sin problem. And as the New Testament teaches... The old Leviticus laws were really symbolic of the life and the death of Jesus Christ. And there were no more reasons for symbolic services once Christ came and paid the price for sin. Those sacrifices were only enacted day by day, week by week, month by month, until the death of Christ. And the New Testament says he made one sacrifice for sins forever. Now, Your Honor... There's nothing in any of this that would ever suggest that we throw out God's law because the ceremonial laws are no longer necessary. The moral law will stand forever because it represents the principle by which life is sustained. And that also includes the fourth commandment. There's absolutely no biblical evidence that the Sabbath was moved to the first day of the week. Rather, the Bible suggests that Christians kept it after the resurrection of Christ because it was not a Jewish law, but because it was biblical teaching. I therefore present to the court today that the enforcement of Sunday legislation represents the virtual abolition of freedom of conscience and religious liberty.
Well, this is the Valley of Chanfaran. Over there is the little town of Chanfaran. And this hillside must be where the first ecumenical council was held. You know what ecumenical is? Isn't that where um, the churches unite? Yes, and that's exactly what happened here. See, the, the Waldenses had deteriorated. They had lost their old flame. They had lost their vision and lost the concept of their heredity. There was still a bit of spark in them. When they heard about the rumors of the Reformation, they wanted to know more about it. And so they sent delegates there. One of the pastors, a pastor Martin, in 1530, brought back some of the, Wal some of the Protestant books to the Waldenses. After studying through these writings, they noticed the strange, you know, new concepts among the reformers. Oh, things like, you know, their concept of original sin and the idea of predestination. There was a number of things there that weren't part of the Waldenses' original faith. But they did notice that the Protestants wanted to stand by the Bible and the Bible only. And that the Protestants believed, as the Waldenses did, that the Church of Rome was Antichrist. They invited uh, Protestant reformers to come and meet with them here in Chanfaran. A man by the name of William Farrell and a man by the name of Anthony Saunier. And they met here in the valley with some Albigenses. They came down from the mountains on the French side. And also from Waldenses of Calabria. Evidently the Crusades hadn't entirely destroyed these people. And also they found that there were some Waldenses that came from as far away as Bohemia. And with this, this group of men from all over uh, Europe, they met for six days and they studied their Bible and they came to a certain uh, agreement on the doctrines that they would hold and they put out a little creed. At the same time, the Waldenses wanted to give something to the Reformation and so they ordered uh, the Waldensee Bible to be translated into French. This was done by a man named Olivetan over in Switzerland, and he worked closely with a relative of his by the name of Calvin. You might have remembered the name Calvin in the mm. Reformation. Well, they produced this, this full and complete Bible in the French language. And from the publication of that, that Bible scattered uh, throughout the revived evangelical movement that was taking place. Now, the Waldenses, in order to be part of an ecumenical movement, submitted some of their old doctrines. And we don't know what those old doctrines were, or we can guess, but I assume that some of the things that were taught and believed by the primitive Christian church had been lost at this time. And very few Waldenses probably remembered them. The thing is, though, they joined the Reformation, which was an effort for uh, a return to the true light of the whole Bible. But then their problems just began all over again. And then in 16... 29, one of the biggest blows took place. Here in these valleys, some terrible storms came through. And with the water rushing down the mountainside, a number of the villages were completely washed away. With all that disease and or all of the problems of famine that came about as a result of that, in the next year, a disease broke out into this in this country. And we find that two-thirds of the Waldenses were destroyed. And then in 1655, a massive campaign was launched again to destroy them. You see, in 1650, the Inquisition, it was called the, uh, the uh, Office for the Propagation of the Faith, was established in Turin. And from that time on, a systematic campaign was launched against them. It wasn't really until 1685, though, that we could call a war of extermination took place. The valleys were assaulted one last time, and... And the few Waldenses that were left was only about 14,000 of them. They were gathered together and they were brought down to the dungeons in Torino. And there they were treated worse than the blacks were treated in the galleys uh, as they were brought over from, from Africa to the New World and to Europe. Then many of them died there of terrible diseases. By the time the Protestant nations realized what was going on and put pressure upon the Catholic nations to release these Waldenses, there were only about 3,000 of them left. And they forced them to march over the mountains to, to Switzerland, to Geneva, in the dead of winter. And I think most of them made it. Only about 80-some-odd um, Waldenses died. But then uh, groups 
uh, after that, periodically began to march over the mountains, and they made their way to Geneva. But in Geneva, they weren't happy at all. And uh, in 1889, a movement uh, began among them to come back to their valleys. A pastor by the name of Enrico Arnott gathered together about 800 of them, and, and they made their way back here. There were certain political events that took place and certain miraculous deliverances, and now these people are in their valleys again. And it's a reminder of the past. But it's up to all of us to begin to do some real research and study and find out the true history of the thing. You know what I think kept them alive more than anything else through the century was that Bible there. They were people of the Bible more than any other church that ever existed. Their pastors studied for long years just, uh, just further up in the woods here, up in the valley of Angragna, in a little valley called Prado del Tor, is the old school where the pastors were trained. Would you like to see that? Yeah. Why don't we go on up there? Right. After all is said and done, I contend that there is no difference between the observance of the seventh day of the week and the observance of the first day of the week. Is God so pedantic? Is this not simply a matter of two different names and numbers? If God wants us to keep aside one day in seven, then why can't it be in commemoration of his resurrection? Surely we are not to embrace the legalism of the Jews that Christ came to release us from. Your Honour, the significance of the Sabbath transcends all religious ritual. I'm sure that when God said remember... He meant just that. He meant us to remember the Sabbath. God also refers to the Sabbath as being a sign between him and his people. Let me give you an interesting parallel. There was an abundance of beautiful trees bearing fruit in the Garden of Eden. Surely the eating of one was no different from the eating of another. But to God, it was a test of trust and loyalty. It was not up to Adam and Eve to decide which trees could be eaten and which fruit should not be eaten of the trees in the garden. God said you'll not eat of that particular tree, not even touch it or you'll die. Now I ask, does that seem reasonable? Does it seem logical? No, not at all, far from it. Why was the fruit untouchable then? It was a test of loyalty for Adam and Eve. Satan thought that he could change the rules. Hey Jim, slow down for a minute. I'm going to read you something. So, now the teacher becomes a student, huh? <laughs> no. But this book you gave me states the same reason for papal persecution that you mentioned. Hmm. The very existence of this people holding the faith of the ancient church was a constant testimony to Rome's apostasy and therefore excited the most bitter hatred and persecution. Their refusal to surrender the scriptures was also an offence that Rome... Yeah, I remember this book that Jim actually gave me um, when we were travelling around. And, um, man, I tell you what... <laughs> The things I was reading in that book just like blew me away, and especially when um, you know the church had used the state to force this law on uh, everybody, and how they uh, they just slaughtered millions of people, and you know you think we'd learn by by the past, but you know what Jim always used to say to me he says you know it's just amazing how people soon forget about the past. And I tell you what, that really, really worries me a lot. Because, you know, if we don't do something about this and at least try and stand up, we've got a problem on our hands. And, and that really worries me. Really worries me. Did he know that they were registered in the books of heaven to confront him at the judgment? 
Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, said Jesus, ye have done it unto me. So much to answer for. It just goes to prove one thing. You don't have to do anything wrong to be persecuted. But if that's true, then why isn't there persecution today? You said the Roman church hasn't changed. Well, there is some persecution. What? Well, what were you arrested for? For working on Sunday. That's right. Terry, every time religious bigotry makes its way into power, it always uses the secular forces, it always uses the police. But Sunday is the Sabbath, not only for the Roman church, but for the whole Protestant world. It's from the Bible. Keep studying that book I gave you, and it'll all become clear before long. We'll talk about it soon. It's always later, isn't it? Every time this, this Sunday thing comes up, it's always later. Listen, I promise you, when we get to Trent, it'll all make sense. The reason that persecution sleeps now is because real Christianity is asleep. You let the spirit of the early church revive, and you'll see a revival of persecution, I can promise you. Well, what's the difference between the Christianity now and real Christianity? Real Christianity keeps the entire law of God, all Ten Commandments. See, the Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 12 that the remnant or the church at the end of time will keep God's commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in 1 John chapter 3, John says, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And today the Protestant world says that the law was done away on the cross. When the Bible says that Jesus came to magnify the law, and it brings the world and the other churches to account for their sins. You see, real Christianity has to unite with the presentation of the gospel something called present truth. And that present truth in this day and age is the teaching of the judgment and of the soon return of Christ and of the destruction of the world and of the destruction of sinners. Now, if a person hears this and their hearts are convicted, then they flee to a real savior. And that real Savior really changes their life. The Bible says that all things become new, that we become new creatures. All things are done away. Well, what this is going to cause in a family is maybe a rupture of the family. If a person is a member of a church that doesn't preach the whole church, they'll leave that church and search for another that presents the whole truth. So it causes a tremendous change in society. Also, when you take into consideration that the Waldenses in their day presented present truth and part of that was to expose the Roman church as the Antichrist. The Roman church tried desperately to get the Protestants to look someplace else for an Antichrist. So she created the idea that the Antichrist had come way in the past at the time of Nero. And then she created another view of the prophecy that presented the idea that the Antichrist was to come way in the future. Well the Protestants were confused by that. And since she's infiltrated their churches and preached from their pulpits and entered their colleges and universities, she's turned their mind away from viewing prophecy the way the Protestants had done all through the centuries. Now Protestants are pointing to the New Age movement as Antichrist. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now the real Christians have a responsibility to expose error and present the truth at the same time. Therefore, they have to expose Roman Catholicism as the Antichrist today. They have to expose the errors in Protestantism. And this is going to bring down the persecution of the entire Christian world on their heads. Believe me, persecution is going to rise again, and it'll be just as horrible as it was during the Dark Ages. We'll talk about that later again, too, when we get up to Trent. Right now, let's go up and see that school. Come on. Up. Oh, good. Terry, take a look at this. Hey, that's the same. That's fantastic. Yeah, this is the old cathedral of Brazil. This little town hasn't changed much in hundreds of years. It used to be the heart of a fabulous civilization in southern France. 
but it wasn't part of the French monarchy, it was independent. It was kind of experiencing a renaissance before the renaissance. I'll tell you more about it when we get up to the, the mountain. Let's go. Ready? Yeah. You know, I began to realize how much I didn't know. And I was thinking back then that, you know, there must be a lot of people out there that are ignorant also to this information. And, uh, I mean, people really need to know about this. Introducing Sunday legislation, we're assuming that any day is acceptable to God as a day of worship. But God has made his Sabbath a symbol of allegiance. Keeping the Sabbath is a matter of trust, a symbol of our close relationship with the God we serve. The Sabbath was set apart, remember, sanctified for a holy purpose from the other six days as a day of worship of the Creator and also a reminder of His work in creation. Then one day, along comes an elite group of men about the 4th century A.D., and they suggest we can dispense with a symbol, we can change the day of worship to Sunday, which was a pagan worship day. Tragically, this act was influenced by the church in Rome's entanglement with pagan ritual at the time. I would suggest the Seventh-day Sabbath is more than an option, and it's not up to mere mortals to change it. Are we to be blind to the Holy Scriptures? which states very clearly that the seventh-day Sabbath was divinely appointed. And today, as a result, we sit in this courthouse because we've forgotten the very thing that God said we should remember. Are you a lawyer or a minister? <laughs> It's a climb, isn't it? Yeah. Boy, they must have been short. Yeah, did you see that rock ceiling in there? Yeah, it's incredible. Well, what do you think of the College of the Onkels? Onkels? Yeah, that's what barbs mean. The College of the Barbs is the College of the Onkels. You see, the Waldensies wanted to name their pastors something that would give their children a feeling that these pastors were part of the families. And, of course, they wouldn't use the word father. Why? Well, the Bible says, Call no man father but your father in heaven. And so they called him Uncle. It's clever, isn't it? Mm. Evidently, young men that wanted to be missionaries from these mountains came to this little school for hundreds of years. And from this school, missionaries went out all over Europe. Their training was long and severe. Let me read to you from this manuscript, and it describes what their training was like. This comes from a historian by the name of S. V. Bombiani. And he says, Their school was in the almost inaccessible solitude of a mountain gorge called the Pra del Tor, 
and their studies were severe and long continued, embracing the Latin, Romant, and the Italian languages. They were well prepared with a knowledge of the Bible when they went out into Europe. They memorized large portions of scriptures. Some of the students that were exceptionally bright were sent to some of the big schools of Europe. They wanted to make sure that their children had the opportunity for advanced education. You know, some people think that the Waldenses were just an ignorant group of people, but they weren't. They were, they were some of the best educated in society. And while they were there, many of them became excellent dialecticians. You know what dialectics is? No. Well, that's the science of debate. And with their knowledge of the Bible and their knowledge of language, and then you put on top of that the ability to debate, well, the monks were terrified of running into these, these Waldensian youth. And because of their skill, the other students looked up to them. Their parents would sew into the lining of their coat um, precious little pages or manuscripts of the Bible. And then when the opportunity arose, they could share with a teacher, an educated individual, or a fellow student. And in this way, they were able to convert people in the higher ranks of society. The young men that went to school here only went here for a portion of their studies. The rest of the time they had to spend with a pastor out doing missionary work. It took them three years before they were able to take a church. During that time they had to pose as itinerant uh, salesmen of exotic wares and they would have jewels and silks and all kinds of fabulous treasures and then they would go to the wealthy families and among these treasures they would have little sheets of paper that had, would have portions of scripture on it and as the people looked at it and asked what are these things then they would drop down on their knee and they would read to them about the plan of salvation and listen these dear folks out there all they had ever seen is the dry formality of Romanism and when they saw that there was a loving savior that they could go right to directly and pray and confess their sins. Well, this was amazing for these people to hear, almost too much for them to bear. As a result, they were converted, and somehow the Catholic Church just couldn't put her finger on it, but she found the noble and the educated in society were becoming Protestants or Waldenses. It was a tremendous thing. Many of these pastors were trained to be physicians, and as they went door to door, they often were doing medical missionary work. One of the chief responsibilities of the students and the pastors, every one of them had to be involved in it, and that was in copying and making Bible manuscripts. They made a special Waldensian Bible. It was smaller than the great big giant Bibles that were found uh, in the Catholic uh, monasteries and things. These little Bibles they could carry with them where they went, and they wore those Bibles out doing missionary work. Many times uh, a youth would never come home. You see, when they went out, they weren't with that pastor all the time. Much of the time they had to be on their own, and then they would meet with that pastor that they were studying under for prayer and for counsel, and then they would go out on their own again. It must have been a very hard life for those young missionaries in preparation for being a pastor. I just wish that pastors today could have that kind of training before they took a church. It'd be incredible. But listen... The Waldensian youth that were trained here weren't the only ones that were educated. The Waldensian children in general were highly educated, even though at sometimes they had to carry on their historical research and their Bible study down in a cave or off on the side of a mountain. They had to keep their studies up. You see, the Waldensians believed that the hope of the preservation of their culture and the truth was done through the minds of their children. They voluntarily moved into these mountains to get their children away from the corruption of the lowlands. And it made their lives a lot harder. Every little bit of ground that was tillable was used to raise food. Their children didn't have a chance to play like our children do. They had to work hard. Evidently, economy and hard work was the kind of school that God had chosen to prepare the, uh, the character of these children. But they had to face terrible persecution. There was no other way. You know, the Waldensee parents would not allow their children to complain or to cry because if they were hiding, one wrong word or one complaint or one little cry could cost the death of the entire community. Those were serious times. And you know, we're facing serious times again, Terry. I believe that our people, Christian people everywhere, should study the history of the Waldenses because that history is going to be repeated.
In summing up, counsel, please try to be concise. The defence may lead. The law as it currently exists, Your Honour, is so intrusive that it tells my client what he can and what he cannot do on the first day of the week, Sunday. By prohibiting my client from engaging in personal activities that do absolutely no harm to anybody else, and expecting my client to ignore the dictates of his conscience concerning his Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, and then demanding that he acknowledge Sunday as having the sanctity of God is an invasion of the most insidious kind. An individual's relationship with God cannot be a matter for the state. My client, therefore, is forced to acknowledge the admonition of the Apostle Peter. We ought to obey God rather than man. My client therefore rejects the notion of Sunday sacredness as a matter of conscience. Other states in this country have denounced this law as antiquated. And for the sake of moral integrity, we ought to do exactly the same in this state. From the evidence presented, it's very clear that this law has no valid biblical or historical basis of God's day. Bringing religious interpretations into civil law compromises the law itself and it invites subjective assessment. God therefore is the ultimate judge and matters of conscience such as this should be left in that very same realm. It's very dangerous day if this court sees to convict a citizen just because of a religious law. I'd like to ask the court two questions finally. One, by what authority do we legislate on matters of personal belief? And number two, shouldn't this decision be left to God? Um, thank you. The reason I wanted to stop is I wanted to get a picture of this thing. It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a Bastille of the Inquisition. It's about 800 years old. 800? Yeah. It's back at the time of the massacre around that city of Brazier's we just saw. Yeah. See, that was the one of the areas where the massacres took place, but this was the Roman Catholic fortification where the orders went out to the armies. In fact, thousands of Christians were taken here and tortured to death. They have the best kept torture implements in all of Europe here in one of those towers, but they won't let anyone see it anymore. Would you like to go down and look around the town? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it.
Actually, I couldn't wait to get home to tell my family and friends what I had learned. I mean, I decided to, you know, follow the dictates of my conscience. I mean, I wanted to cherish truth. And whatever it took, it didn't matter what happened to me. You know, I needed to follow a, an everlasting God instead of following human nature. There it is, Terry, the Valley of Trent. Fantastic, isn't it? Oh, it's magnificent. This valley was a central focus of religious interest for about 20 years during the Reformation. Down here is the old town. Can you see the church down there at the heart of the town? They preserved that structure. It's from the 15th century. It was down there that the famous council was held. You want to go down and check it out? Okay, let's go. Oh, just around the corner is the Piazza del Duomo. I want to get a picture of the fountain there. Also, look, don't let me forget. I've got to get a picture in the Santa Maria Maggiore. The interior of that is where a lot of important things took place here. There is a wall here, Frank. I don't want to be put off any longer. But I want to know the issues behind the Sunday law. Okay, but I haven't really been putting you off. You know, I've been laying a foundation for what I want to share here all along. Well, I've never been confronted with so much overwhelming information before in my life. Well, there's just so much information that you had to know and had to understand before you'd even be willing to believe what I'm about to tell you. I can appreciate that. But first, would you tell me why we had to come here to Trent? Oh, that's easy. You have that travel book on Italy. Yeah. Well, I underlined something on page 358. Read it. It was here, from 1545 to 1563, that the structure of the Catholic Church was redefined in the famous Council of Trent. This was the starting point of the Counter-Reformation, which brought half of Europe back to Catholicism. What's a Counter-Reformation? Well, it's just what the words indicate. It's a mobilization of Roman Catholic forces to regain all that she lost to the Reformation. Listen, in that book that I gave you to read on page 495, I underlined a few things for you to read. Do you have that with you? Yeah. 495. Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than at any former period in her history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing her device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to re-establish persecution, and to undo all that Protestant Protestantism has done. I don't believe it. It's not true. I have friends that are Roman Catholics, and they would never dream of doing anything like this. And not only that, the Pope is bringing peace and unity to the world. I agree with all that, Terry. I wouldn't question the goodness of the Roman Catholic people. Roman Catholic Christians are just as wonderful as Christians are everywhere, and, and I'm sure that her leadership believe that they're doing God's will. But the majority of Roman Catholics don't understand the issues and the history and the goals and the principles of their own organization. Terry, if they did, I believe that most of them would take a stand with us for religious liberty. Remember, the, the Protestant Reformation 
was begun by Catholic monks and Catholic priests who, after finding their way to the Bible, spoke out against the corruptions and errors of the Roman papacy. But the hierarchy wouldn't listen to them. It cast them out. It excommunicated them and called them heretics. Even today, every time a Roman Catholic finds their way to the Bible and studies it and believes it, they become a Protestant. That was the history of my family. Yeah, funny you mention that. My mother, she accepted the Bible as her authority and left the Catholic faith. You see, Terry, that's the issue, authority. Whether the Bible will be the authority or whether the Roman Catholic Church will be the authority. You see, the Roman Church, like the old Orthodox churches, has what we call a hierarchical system. That means they have a pope or patriarch at the top, then the bishops and the priests, and then the people at the bottom. And the people have nothing to say about anything. They can't influence their leaders. They can't even disagree with anything their leaders have to say. But the Roman Church went one step further. She claims infallibility. What's infallibility? Well, that means that she claims she's never erred, never can err, and never will err. She claims that God somehow gave his authority and his power and his infallibility to Peter and gave Peter keys of heaven and hell and that Peter transferred this to the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. So anything that comes through that hierarchy, any of the canon laws, any of the dogmas, any of the principles of the past, the Roman Church has to defend because supposedly they came through an infallible source. If they were to apologize or admit they were wrong about any of their canon laws, even the ones that were developed during the darkest ages of history, the entire power structure comes collapsing down. Read about that, I think, on page 508. Let it be remembered, it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. And had she but the power, she would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in the past centuries. Boy, that's terrifying. But where does Sunday fit into all this? Sunday's an extremely important part of the whole controversy over authority. You see, if the Counter-Reformation were complete, you and I would be under the complete dominion of Rome and we would have to submit to the mark of Rome's ecclesiastical authority, the sign of her infallibility. Prosecution? Yes, Your Honor. We must remember the main point here. A change has been made. The Sunday law is a law of the state and therefore needs to be enforced. We are citizens of the state and are required to abide by its laws. Your Honour, whatever the defence has to say about the defendant's religious beliefs, he has violated a civil statute. The Sunday legislation that this court is addressing deals with civil matters such as Sunday trading and the right of the citizen to have a regular weekly day of rest. If the law does not compel anyone to attend a religious service, how can it be a religious law? The fact that trade unions support this law demonstrates its non-sectarian character. The religious community is strongly behind this legislation, as the defence has observed, but that is out of concern for others. Their good intentions and sense of civic duty do not make a civil law a religious law. Your Honour, churchgoers have the same rights as non-churchgoers to vote on civil matters. Sunday legislation was passed by the state as an expression of the will of the people, at least the vast majority of the people. The defendant is in trouble because it is the state and not the church that requires its citizens to obey the law. It is the state and not the church that is enforcing the law, and it is the state and not the church that will impose penalties on those who violate the law. The defendant has violated a civil code, and all the demonstration about religious liberty is not relevant here. Your Honour, the defendant himself supports the case for the prosecution. He has done that by admitting that he has violated state legislation. The prosecution merely asks 
that the court accept his own admission of guilt as proof that he is guilty. Thank you. The court will recess for one hour. My conviction just grew day by day. I became more and more aware of being led. And I was convinced that there was a purpose in my life now. I mean, I could feel that God was leading me and, and I was being you know, rewarded for my decision to seek truth. But what's the mark of her authority? Not Sunday. But that's the Sabbath of the entire Christian world. Oh, Terry, at this point, you and I need to have a Bible study. <laughs> I can tell by the look on your face I'm in for it, right? You sure are. Here. Take this and open it to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Do you see that, Terry? This is God giving his sacred Ten Commandment law on Mount Sinai and writing it with his own finger on tables of stone. And he says right there that the seventh day, or Saturday, is the Sabbath of the Lord God. He gave that Sabbath on the seventh day of creation. Those hours were sanctified, and he intended it to be that way for all eternity. Look up Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. You see, Terry, whatever God does, it is forever. The reason is, is God cannot err, nor will he ever err. When he commands something, his infallible authority makes it permanent. Now, God intended that the Sabbath should last Forever. And the proof of that is in Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. You see that? All flesh. And that's when this earth is made entirely new, forever. That means from the formation of the Sabbath in Eden all the way through eternity, it never changes, Terry. Now, in the book of Hebrews, Paul says that we are sanctified to the body of Christ. And Ezekiel tells us in Ezekiel 20, verse 20, that my Sabbath I've given them that it would be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. If sanctification comes through the body of Jesus and Jesus said the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath, then Terry, the seventh day Sabbath is the sign of the sanctifier, Jesus Christ. It's truly the sign of the real Christian church, and it'll be that way forever. Well, where did Sunday come from? Well, it's best if you read it than have me tell you. I have a book here that's an authenticated book on the teachings of Catholicism by a Jesuit priest, and it's current. And look on page 325 and read the question and answers concerning the Sabbath and where it came from. What obligation was imposed on the Israelites by the third commandment of God? The third commandment? Well, the Sabbath commandment is really the fourth commandment. But the Roman church claims the power to change God's laws. And there was one law she couldn't deal with. That was the second commandment. That was the law against making or bowing down to images. 
So she just removed it from the law, pushed all the other laws up, and put the fourth commandment in the third commandment's place. The Jews were obliged to devote the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, to rest and religious observance. Does the commandment still remain in force? Yes, it remains as operative today as it was in the time of the Israelites. One day of each week must be sacred to God, but the Catholic Church transferred the observance from the seventh to the first day of the week. Why was that change made? Since the two most joyful events in the history of mankind occurred on Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus from death and the descent of the Holy Ghost on the Apostles, the Catholic Church deemed it more fitting to appoint this day rather than Saturday, the festival day of the Christians. It's clear. Well, how does Trent fit into all this? Was the Sabbath shifted from Saturday to Sunday at Trent? Oh no, the Sabbath, the Roman Church uh, <coughs> transferred the sanctity from Saturday to Sunday or they claim they did, in the 4th century at a place called the Council of Laodicea. Now up to that time, all the Christians throughout the world, except for just a few sets, honored the seventh day as the Sabbath, and that was from the time of Christ. Most of the Christian churches didn't go along with this claim to change the Sabbath to Sunday and continued to keep the true Sabbath for hundreds of years. But with the rise of papal authority in Europe, and with the continual harassment and warfare and persecution and bloodshed and violence, why the Sabbath was lost and Sunday seemed to become the Sabbath of all of Europe except for just a few groups who preserved it. And you know about those few groups, um, there were still some Sabbath keepers at the time of the Reformation. And at towards the end of the Reformation period, the, these Sabbath keepers passed on the Sabbath to America. Many of these Sabbath keepers were persecuted and they fled to Independence, Rhode Island, and there they fought for, the, the, for religious liberty. And then they passed on the Sabbath to the Great Advent Awakening movement of the 19th century. But see, Protestants, they came out of Roman Catholicism and they brought with them the Roman Catholic Sabbath. Oh, Terry, I just tremble when I think of what's coming on this world. As an overwhelming surprise, you see, the Protestants in their blindness are reaching out and grasping the hands with Rome. And with these manifestations of modern spiritualism, the world thinks it's moving into an age of peace and prosperity and unity. And anyone who protests this is going to receive religious persecution. This Sunday thing is just the beginning of that persecution. I shudder to think of what's going to happen. contemplated the issues in this case like no other. But I keep coming back to the fact that if this law should be abolished, it is not the business of this court, but it is up to our proper democratic processes. I am sympathetic to the, the defender's position, but if people want these laws changed, then they must engage the appropriate political process. The laws we have are a combination of the people's wishes and because of this I have no authority to disregard this law or to rewrite history. My duty is to uphold the laws of this state so therefore I find a defendant guilty as charged. I impose a penalty of five thousand dollars or six months in prison. Now I find myself a prisoner in my own country I mean, really, what have I done? I mean, I've acknowledged that I have the right to religious liberty, freedom of choice. I remember when 
Jim mentioned to me, he said, when church and state get together, the same thing will happen as it did in the past. And history tells us that the Inquisition <laughs> slaughtered millions. Millions. And that's how dangerous thing is. That, you know, it, this isn't just a traffic ticket. This isn't even a federal offense type of thing. What it is is, is an international power that would think nothing of just destroying you and your family. And I don't want to... He used to say, that. how soon people forget. Jim, Tony and Joy all perished together in a plane crash near Anchorage, Alaska, one week ago, Sunday night, September 2.